<laughs> Welcome to Conversations in Commerce, where we have candid conversations about technology, e-commerce, print, and the supply chain, and we try to have a little fun in the process. I'm your host, Andrew Alford, and with me today is our co-host, Alyssa. Hey, Alyssa, how's it going? Hi, good. How are you? Good. I understand you've been really busy since the last show. Matter of fact, you've been working on a pretty powerful collaboration with uh, with Vanguard Direct. Is that right? Yes. I've had the pleasure of working with Vanguard on an article uh, regarding a uh, project that they've done with uh, the United Way of Connecticut 211 and the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So essentially what they did is they had Gizmo, uh, who is a therapy dog. Here's a picture of Gizmo right here. He's a therapy dog in uh, Connecticut schools. And uh, they created a, uh, a kit with uh, different uh, products in it. You know, some of them had like uh, stress balls in them, a stuffed dog uh, shaped exactly like Gizmo. And all of this was to uh, promote and to educate children on uh, mental health care, kind of, uh, you know, get rid of that, uh, stig uh, you know, the stigma behind it early on. That's a that's a really good um, application, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You know, when you think about children's health, you don't necessarily in consider uh, their mental well-being. And, and a program like this is sorely needed uh, in a world where, you know, we're mostly concerned about the physical needs of a child. But the reality is, just like adults, they go through um, periods of uh, mental health crises and, and their own needs. So kudos. That, that, that's a really great program. Kudos to the folks at Vanguard Direct, John and his team, and uh, United Way for, for pulling that together. Uh, what an incredible, um, what an incredible uh, process and program they put on. Uh, so without further ado, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce today's guest. Uh, we have an exciting show lined up for you today. Um, today's guest is the Managing Director for Corporate Development Associates. Uh, he considers himself uh, a millennial trapped in a baby boomer's body. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, he is a husband. He's a dad. He's a grandpa. He is a member of the Ben Franklin Honor Society, which is an incredible honor in itself. Um, he was the chairman of PER for years and years and years. And recently, I had the personal privilege of awarding him with Brand Chain's President's Award. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show uh, Roger Bogg. Hey, Roger. Hello, everybody. Hey, Roger. So um, I've had the pleasure of working with you in uh, various different roles across the gamut. I'd say, you know, serving across, you know, like serving on the same board together. Um, we've shared the same industry insights for the past, I don't know, 20 plus years. It's been a minute. I don't want to date either one of us, but um, I, I'd be really surprised if um, most of our viewers and listeners haven't, haven't interacted with you at some point in their own careers. Um, but um, for those of you who don't know you, and to enrich the knowledge of the folks that do know you, um, share a little bit about your origin story. In other words, you know, how did you get to, to where you are today, and what got you into the field of M&A? Um, you know, it's, it's been a fun ride, because I actually started uh, really young. I've been in the printing business my entire career. I joke with people and tell them that I started when I was five, because my dad was a printer for 33 years. And he was working in this uh, weekly newspaper shop, and he brought home a crate that, that was from a letterpress that their company had purchased. And they let Dad bring the crate home, and it became my playhouse, my brother's and my playhouse in the backyard. I've got a picture of myself when I'm five, and over my left shoulder it says Heidelberg. And five or ten years later, I was actually running the press at Amy. And um, I started the career. I got into forums in 71. I uh, worked with some really great companies over the next uh, 45, 50 years. And then in 2017, I wanted to stay in the business, but get out of what I was doing, out of the manufacturing side. And I was attending a small distributor summit actually in St. Louis. And George Crump, I think you may know George, mm -hmm. was doing a presentation talking about all the companies that he had started and sold and started and done things with. And he made a statement, this was on a Saturday, he made a statement that said, it's hard to move forward if you have a path of retreat. And I thought about that over the weekend, and I went in Monday morning and resigned. And didn't have a job, didn't know what I was going to do. And then a friend of mine who does M&A called me up and said, you know, you know a lot of people, you know a lot of stuff about equipment and processes, distributors and market sales trends. He said, why don't you come try doing M&A? And, &A? and uh, so I started in 17, been doing it ever since, and just having a ball. Well, that's, uh, that's quite a jump, right, from what you've done historically over to M&A. And I know M&A often gets a bad rap. Matter of fact, I've got a few things queued up on my soundboard, right? So when when, when somebody mentions mergers and acquisitions, uh, a lot of times the, the audience does this little number here, right? Oh, that's that's not fair. And, and, and sometimes 
if you're a member of the, the company being swallowed by an acquisition, you hear, Ooh. Ooh, that's, that's kind of nasty. So obviously we, we don't like hearing those things. And, and that brings us to the, um, to the topic of our show today, uh, which we call M&A, The Reaper, and You. And so the, the goal here is to kind of dispel some of the negative myths and connotations that, um, you know, kind of form around the topic of M&A. And we, we really want to properly define this for our audience. So, um, Roger, I know a lot of folks equate M&A companies as the touch of death, the, the grim reaper, and maybe some even call it the last resort. And I think a lot of people blame it for industry consolidation. And while not entirely accurate, it's definitely a viewpoint that a lot of people in this industry share. So um, since it's not really a fair way to look at it, how would you respond to someone that, that sort of has this viewpoint? What do you do to change their mind, size myths? And maybe as, as a third here, um, while you're at it, maybe what other myths do you come across in M&A um, in, in the circles that you run? You know, it, it is a myth because when you, when you think about it, you know, any company out there, I don't care what it is, what they make, what you sell, what you produce, at some point in time, one of two things is going to occur. You're either going to close or you're going to sell. Um, there really isn't any other option. You know, we, we've seen companies run their business until you know, the owner literally dies at his desk or something like that, and they have no exit plan and no succession plan. But you know, a company is going to do one or the other. And so you know, M&A is actually like, like a rebirth. It's, it's a way to take a company someone has built that they care about, it's been their passion, their life, their dream, and it's a way to make that thing keep going on. Um, you know, either with a new owner or merging with another company, whatever it may be. So, you know, the idea that it's the end is is not really justified very well. And you know, when so, something like that happens, part of the process is people don't buy companies to leave them the same, and they certainly don't buy them to see them to go down. They buy them to grow them. So what normally happens is an acquisition, someone gets acquired and that company grows over the next few years. And, you know, there's more staff, there's more equipment, there's new technology added. There's a lot of cool things that can happen as opposed to the other option, which is someone throws the keys on the desk on the way out the door and they lock it and they go away. So, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a good idea or a good thought that that's the end of the world. It's actually pretty much more of a new beginning. Um, you know, the other myth that we run across quite a bit is when someone decides they do want to exit is what the company is actually worth. Um, we always tell everybody that, you know, I can tell you what your company's worth. You can tell me what you think your company's worth, but the, the, the market's going to tell you what your company is worth. And you, know, those three numbers are never going to be the same. I mean, we can have a pretty good idea of it, but one of the things that we, we do run into quite a bit with people who do want to exit, they come talk to us is they, they had a, have a misconception of what their company is actually worth. And that's one of the very first conversations that has to take place. And sometimes, frankly, that's not as, as easy as we like to like it to be. You make a lot of excellent points, right? So you know, I feel like we, you, you did a great job of taking the edge off the conversation. Thank you for that, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, we always have to start on that weird note and find our way through it. So um, I guess I have to ask the question, um, why, why does somebody want to sell their company? What, what brings them to this point? Um, what, what are their reasons? You know, there's, there's generally three reasons. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's generally retirement. Um, you know, someone's ran it for a long number of years. They don't have children in the business, or if they do, they don't want to take over the business. You know, they want to uh, exit while the exiting timing is good. Uh, maybe there's buying going on. Maybe they just reached that point where they want to travel more, want to spend more time with their family, their grandchildren. So, uh, you know, the first and foremost, it's usually, I just want to enjoy my life now, and I need to, to do that. I have to get rid of this because it occupies so much of my time. You know, another part time is, uh, you know, sometimes people are just tired of the risk. Um, they want to stay in the business, but it's been rough on them. Um, maybe they're in a market or a product line that's difficult to sell. We don't have the wherewithal or maybe the money to do what they really need to do to take the company to the next level. So they, they sell mainly in order to get funding or some backing, maybe from a private equity firm, something like that. So the company can continue and grow and maybe they stay with it. Maybe they don't, you know, and the third one in some point, some people just build a company at to a certain level and they want to cash out and they're going to go do it again. I've actually had the pleasure of working with two guys who are on their third companies now. 
because they build, they come up to a certain level, they have fun, they sell it, and they want to go start a brand new one because their passion in life is creating. It's not running. So they just take something, start it, build it, sell it. So those are the, the, the primary ones. But, you know, the, the, the real one that really hits uh, what we see most of the time is people just want to exit because they've reached that point in life. They want to enjoy what they've made. So, so it sounds like retirement is probably the most common. I, I was, I was about to make a bet on maybe the serial entrepreneur because that actually sounds like a pretty exciting, uh, an exhilarating path for M and A. But so it, it does sound like it's it's folks looking to retire. Maybe they can't um, hand their, their their company over to one of their kids, for, for example. Is it, that that sounds like one of the primary reasons. Mm-hmm. That that, that tr- truly is, and and you know sometimes there's kids in the business, but the kids just don't have interest in owning the business. You know, they're, they're happy there. Maybe they like it. Maybe they would like to exit as well. But it's, it, that's, you know, wanting to retire and, and like say, enjoy the fruits of your labor. Um, and of course, that means you have to do something with the company and you want the company to survive as well. So that, that's when the discussions have to start taking place. I gotcha. Um, now, I, I know for, for owners that are looking to sell, it's a, it's a really tough decision, right? This isn't something that they just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to do this. Um, it's got to be a strong mix of emotions, right? It, it really is. Uh, in fact, we try to encourage people that they need to start thinking about this several years before they intend to do it. You know, if you have a, if you want to retire when you're 65, then put the note in your calendar that when you turn 62, you need to start thinking about an exit plan because a good exit plan takes a, a long time to really formalize and strategize if you want to do it correctly. So, you know, that, it, and it is a very emotional thing. You're talking about, you know, somebody's selling their baby. You know, it's something they've created, they've grown. They've probably got employees that have been with them 15, 20 or more years. You know, that's like family. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and they're worried about them. They they want to cash out. They want to take their money, but they want to make sure these people still have jobs. They want to make sure they're taken care of. You know, they want to make sure their benefits stay the same. Um, and it gets really tough. And then you've got the guys or girls, like, this is what they come to work every day. So one of the conversations that has to take place is, okay, you know, it's, it's now closing. It's the day after closing. What are you going to do with your life? You know, if you don't have a good answer for that, you might want to rethink selling. Maybe this isn't the time until you decide there is something else out there. Really, really great points. And and while I'm not in that point in my career, meaning I, I can't imagine being in the position, I do have the utmost respect for owners that are struggling to make that decision. You know, you worry about your people, you worry about your customers, you worry about the longevity of your business once you sell. Um, and even if the time is right, all right, those emotions and feelings are still there. So let, let's say we have an right. owner that, that's come to terms with his or her reality, and they're ready to move forward. Um, I know that there's a process. Um, there's, there's some sort of system, right, that you take them through. What, what does that look like? What is that process? You know, um, one of the first things we, we like to do is we, we obviously have to get a value on the company. Because as, as I said, people will come to us and say, well, I think I'm worth so much. And the first thing we say is, okay, how did you pull that out of the air? And most of them will tell us, well, I pulled it out of the air. You know, I, I, I think that's what it, it was worth in my mind, but they don't have any financial justification. And buyers only are going to look fine at finances and your, your P and L sheet, your balance sheet, your history. That's what they're going to make a decision. So one of the first things we have to do is we talk, have to talk about valuation with people and we have to, you know, do our own valuation. We have to make sure that they agree with that is within a range that they would accept. And sometimes they don't, you know, sometimes we have to come back to them with the bad news of, you know, they think it's here and we're saying the market's going to tell you it's here. You know, I can, I can, I can sit trying to offer you a house at a million dollars, but if it's a $500,000 house, you're you're not even going to get an offer. So is that, is that step one then? And so, um, let's say, yeah, because I guess people have that mis- mis- uh, misconception often about what, what their company is worth, right? You just said it. Very, yeah, very much so. That, that's the first thing that, that has to be decided um, you know, in the process. We do, we do the valuation. We make sure that everybody's in full agreement. You know, then what, what has to do is obviously you have to think about who's the best buyer. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's, you, you don't want to blast an email out to you know, a thousand printers out there 
and say, hey, does anybody want to buy a company that does X, Y, Z, that does $5 million in revenue? You know, you just don't want to do that because, one, you're going to get a whole bunch of tire kickers. Um, what you want to do is you want to look at the company. Um, you want to de define a profile of who the best buyer would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to look at the culture. We want to look at the geolocation. We want to look at the, the market. How do they go to the market? We want to look at their customer concentration. We want to look at the age. There's a lot of factors that we take into consideration that, that you say, okay, the best buyer would be someone like that, 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 that. And then what we want to try to do is go out and find five or 10, that, 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 that. Um, you know, th th then you've got people you can bring to the table. Uh, once we get somebody interested in it, you know, of course, we have to share information about the selling company, which is always done under NDAs, things like that. You know, we, we talk to people, we get some conversations going, we get interest. That generally includes some site visits and some more conversations. Zoom, of course, is, is a great avenue. It gives us a chance to let people talk about cultures without actually physically going into a facility just yet. You know, and, and we go through all of those steps, and then we get to the point where a buyer says, you know what, I, I want to make a run at this. And at that point in time, they give us an, what's called an LOI, which is a letter of intent or a letter of expression of intent. And it basically lines out, I like the company. This is what I'm offering. This is the way I'm going to pay you. This is the way the deal structure would be worked out. You know, when I'm going to buy inventory, what you get to keep off the balance sheet, all the details of it. Um, and we submit that and, you know, to the seller and we say, okay, is this acceptable? And it either is or isn't. Maybe we bring in a couple at the same time. You know, the LOI gets accepted. Then you go into the fun part of due diligence. And this can take several months because after a letter of intent is signed, you're ba basically the seller has to open his doors a lot more to where the buyer can come in and really take a hard look at the company. They can look at the equipment. If, if it's digital equipment, they have to look at the number of clicks on it, the age of it, or the end release. All the other details come out, and your attorneys get involved. And that takes up a lot of time. And once you get past that stage, you get to the asset purchase agreement, and that is the final legal document where someone's going to sell the company. That generally takes several revisions, and then, you know, it's decided along. You get a target date for when you're going to close, and everybody moves toward getting all the paperwork done to get it closed on that day. And that day comes around, funds are transferred, and the next morning everybody wakes up with new ownership. Wow. It's, 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 it sounds fairly simple, and it fa sounds fairly stair-stepped, mm -hmm. but it is very, very... I, I was going to say it actually sounded like a lot, right? So um, let me see if I can recap from memory what you said here. There's the valuation, there's profiling the buyer, there's there's the hunt for um, the buyer, right? right. Uh, there's those, those conversations that take place to um, affirm whether or not this is going to work, the letter of intent, mm -hmm. due diligence. Uh, there's your purchase agreement. And finally, after it's all said and done with closing, did I get all that right? You got it right. Ooh, wow. Okay. So there, there's a ton. And there's there's no wonder there's a need for an advisor to help you through process like that. Um, if you were to take, to take a deeper dive into this process, Roger, what, what are some of the key points or metrics that you specifically look for that really help help make the deal? You know, first and foremost is the culture. Um, you know, it's very important that a company, when they're selling, particularly and very important to the seller, the owner, is that as little as possible changes. You know, it'd be nice to leave everything the same. That's probably not going to happen because, obviously, again, the buyer wants to buy it to improve it and grow it. So something's going to change, but it's going to be on the positive side of things. So one of the first things, you know, that needs to be done is you, you have to look at a cultural fit. You know, you want to make sure they're in the kind of in the same markets. They sell the same channels. You know, you can't put a company that sells direct and try to put them with a company that sells through the trade. You know, it's a class. They're going down different channels. So you have to look at the um, second thing we have to look at generally is the geolocation. Um, you know, sometimes a company that is for sale, we'll, we'll say one in Kansas, okay? We need to find someone that wants to acquire something in Kansas. That might be someone that's over in Missouri. It might be at a border state because they want to make an acquisition relatively close. They within driving distance. And then there's all the other people who might be on the east and west coast that say, you know, I'd love to have something in the, in the middle of the country and have another footprint there. You know, I don't have to ship over the Rockies or the Andes. Like I can work with that. 
-hmm. So, you know, ge geographical location comes into play. We have to look at the products and the markets and how they go to, go to market. Uh, we, you know, you don't have to do the same product line, but it probably needs to be a complementary product line. You know, like right now, say a digital printer is probably not going to buy a commercial printer because he doesn't want to go into offset. You know, he's, he's a digital printer that's doing black and white and color work and flyers and postcards might buy a digital white format shop because it's still digital and it's still promotional in nature. So we have to look at those things and make sure that there's complementary products and thought trains in place to really make it look good. Um, we want to look at the customer concentration and what types of customers they are. You know, if they're selling direct, the customer base is, ver is going to be different. We always tell people that, you know, there's two ways to look at your house. You want to look at your financial house and your physical house. Physical house meaning what's the shop floor look like. Financial house is, is what does your P&L look like? You would be surprised at when we get a financial to look at how crappy they are. We got line items that, that make no sense. We got duplicate line items. People pay in their condos. <laughs> yeah, we got condos out in Denver. You know, we got Corvette. Like, okay, you got to clean all that stuff up. Yeah. So, you know, one of those, that, that's something that has to take place. And then of course we have to look at the, the size and general revenue and that, that helps us define again, you know, what type of buyers that might be interested in that is whether is it, are we dealing with a $2 million company or not? Okay. So, um, one of the key points that you hit on really resonated with me because I've got a lot of personal experience in being on both sides of the M&A fence, right? Um, Okay. I, I want to accentuate how critical culture is um, to, to, to the whole transaction. So you can have everything dialed in, like you said. You've got the right product mix. You've got great customer synergies. I mean, everything is, is working really well, but the merger is not going to be successful if the culture aspect um, doesn't play all the way through. And so I'm going to share a little bit of my experience. Um, I'm not going to name names here, but we'll just say that there were two, at one point there were the two largest transactional document printing companies uh, in North America that decided, hey, we're going we're gonna to merge. And so they came through and uh, they did this merger. And while the merger was great, the marketing was great, there were a few, um, a few things. We still internally, we still acted like company A and company B. Matter of fact, the company had two presidents, President A and President B. I won't name names. Um, but but the reality is it was so hard to let go of the way things used to be. And that matter of fact, that was that was the sentiment. Well, this is the way we used to do things or this is the way we've always done things. And it was it was a really ch uh, it was a real challenge to get people on the same same page in, in terms of, well, let's stop thinking about the way we used to do it. And let's think about the way we should do it. And it wasn't until we started having that conversation that the pieces started moving and things started working together. Because I'll say it took us at least six months to a full two years, really, to properly integrate in terms of culture. And, um, you know, about the time that that company was eventually acquired away, some of those cultural issues were still hanging out there, Roger. And so um, that's just my own personal experience with it. And I can, I can name quite a few others where the culture just wasn't the right fit. Like, for example, right. um, one transaction had a, um, a, basically a customer-facing entity purchase a for-trade-only company with the expectation that they would be able to, you know, take over that part of the market as well as dealing with direct customer sales. And you, you know in, in this world that that doesn't fly. Um, and so, it, it, again, it was not a failure, but, man, it, it, was, it was really tough. I, I know exactly which one you're talking about, um, and you're right, you know, and, and it brings up a very good point because, you know, when you've got two entities, you know, let, let's say we're past, you know, most of the conversations and we're maybe even into a letter of intent, you really got to have those conversations with both parties and say, okay, well, we think we like each other. We kind of do things the same. Let's talk about what's going to change, okay? It's, we're not talking about firing customers or anything like that. But let's just talk about what processes are going to take place. What would what the what would the new world look like? Who's going to be in charge of that new world? There's various segments of that new world, and let's make sure that all those personalities don't immediately have a conflict. Because if you're talking oil and water and you haven't even got to the end of the due diligence stage, you better put on the brakes. There's there's you know something's not going to go very well, or you're going to you're going to create a deal in a marriage 
that is not going to be very pleasant for either party uh, later in the day. And and you got to remember that, you know, a lot of deals, it's not just the guy gets a check when he sells a company and rides off into the sunset. A lot of these deals, there's an earn out based on multiple years. And that means that company has to not only survive, it has to grow. Um, if that oil and water, if that's a bad mix, that can affect the guy's paycheck over the next couple of years. So, you know, you, th those conversations, they really have to take place early on and you got to make sure you've got that cultural fit that, that can burn an, an organization down and nothing flat. <laughs> Man, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I think there's some other elements we could talk about here too. So, you know, we talked about how critical that internal adoption is for, for culture, but and what about the customers, right? So they're typically the innocent bystanders in this whole thing. They didn't ask for this, right? They get they get attached to their supplier and the brand that's that's part of that supplier that they've known and loved for a long time. There's a real emotional bond there, um, and I suppose it's impossible to maintain 100 percent maintain 100 percent customer retention. That's just unheard of ever, right? Um, I mean, how can you keep a customer confident and happy during the process? Um, it, or is collateral damage just to be expected? And unfortunately, it's it's probably the latter to a degree. But you know, there's things that can be done. Here, here's one of the biggest challenges uh, when you're doing this, and this is whether you know we're working or you know any broker is working with a distributor or a manufacturer or a supplier, is the, the level of confidentiality that has to be maintained. You know, because when you're going into this, when you're talking to these people about getting a valuation, you're talking about, okay, we're going to put a, a memorandum together. We're going to offer your company for sale. At that point in time, the majority of the time, the only people that are in, in the loop are the owners. You know, their staff doesn't know this is going on. Their customers certainly do not know what's going on. And neither one can know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the, the deals we work with, that's one of their concerns is how do we keep this quiet in the industry? And you know, our industry is a relatively far world when you get down to it. It's not so how quiet. Do you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you keep this quiet in the industry so nobody knows about it? Once you get a deal close to being done and they do notify their employees, then mm -hmm. part of that planning process and due diligence needs to be, how do we address this with the customer? You know, for, for, for sure, the top customers probably need to be visited prior to closing, if at all possible. And if not, immediately after closing. The, the, you know, the old guard needs to take the new guard in. They need to do introductions. They need to do a nice transition and a nice handoff. A lot of times, the owner will be asked to stay on for anywhere from 3 to 12 months to aid in that transition process to make sure that nobody gets lost and we don't lose any of the customers, particularly the big ones. Now, again, you, you commented about, you know, retention. Do you keep 100%? No, because there's always going to be somebody back there that says, you know, I've bought from Bob for 40 years. I'm not buying from not Bob now. I'm buying from Pete. Pete's a nice guy, but I, I like Bob. You know, I also know Tom. Tom's been a guy, a friend of mine for 20 years. I'm going to start sending my volume over to Tom because I don't know Pete. You know, there's going to be some of that. But if it's handled right and it's handled as part of the process, then you're not going to lose very much. It can be managed very well. So um, those are amazing points, and I, I agree with every last one of them. Again, having done quite a few of these myself. Um, so, so Roger, let's say that the deal is done. Merger complete, synergy savings, all of that is in full swing. What what happens next? What does, um, what does life look like post-merger or acquisition? You, you know, that's, it, it's funny because you know, that is the last step, and it's one of the first conversations we have because a seller needs to understand what life after closing is going to look like. You know, they may be part of the uh, the transition period. They may not. You know, it all depends on what they want to do and, and what the buyer wants to do with them. Um, I've had cases where we closed on Friday, and at 4 o'clock, the owner walked out, and nobody ever saw him again. You know, so those, those things have to be discussed and, and owners need to understand what their role is going to be moving forward, if there is going to be one. And if they're not, what is your role going to be in life? You know, what, what are you going to do with your family? Do you have an idea? Uh, they, those things need to be considered because it can get pretty lonely the day after closing. Mm -hmm. If in three months you're no longer needed, you know, you wake up in the morning, you don't play golf, you fish, and your wife's saying, 
Like, don't you have someone to call? <laughs> hey, I've heard that story, that same story, so many times from folks in the industry that have managed and successfully sold their business. Man, you, you couldn't be closer to accurate about that. Um, but, I mean, it sounds like there's a ton of variables in, at, at play in, in all of this. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. Um, do you have any parting thoughts on this? I think our next segment's about to start. So uh, I want to make sure we're able to kind of close out the, the, the thought topic here. You, you know, the, the thing I would encourage everybody to do is, is, is first of all, if, if at all possible, you know, think way in advance. You know, at least three years, again, if you, if you think, at some point in time, because of either age or a rational reason, or you, you're in a dying market and you think there's a cliff coming, whatever that reason is, back that up about three years and start start talking to people. Talk to people who have sold. Talk to friends in the same space. You know, talk to a couple of different brokers. Get an idea of what is the market like. What do you need to do to your company, you know, to, to improve the curve appeal. Um, because, you know, that's one of the first things that they think I've got to take a look at. If I've got a year and a half to really make my company look nice so I can sell it, then let's get to work on that. Let's hire some people to come in and tell me what I need to do. And there are people that will do that. And what I need to do to my company, both in the financial space and structural space and physical space, and, and clean this up so I get the best. You know, think about it in advance, plan for it. And then just execute the plan and, and work with a, with a good advisor. I would highly recommend that. I've talked to a lot of people that try to do it themselves. And as you saw in from the conversations for the last 40 minutes, it's it's complicated. It's yeah. a lot more complicated than people think. So, at least, you know, hire an advisor, get some advice on it, and uh, make a plan, work the plan. So it sounds like I need to get a, before I sell anything, I'd need to get like a the equivalent of an auto detailer for my company before we just go straight into uh, the M&A practices. Clean, clean the car out before you put it on the park. <laughs> and vacuum it out a little bit. That's good to know. You might want to wash the windows. <laughs> wash the windows. Okay, got it. So it looks like it's time for our next segment here, um, which is called... Supply Chain Chatter. Supply Chain Chatter. There it is. So Supply Chain Chatter is where we just kind of talk a little bit about what's going on in the industry. And I think, Alyssa, we've got a little bit of news coming up here at the beginning of May, if I'm not right, mis mistaken. Yes, we do. Uh, so Liftoff will be attending uh, this year's and the final Brand Chain event. Ooh, final. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, a leadership summit, the uh, Brand Chain Leadership Summit. Yeah. That will be taking place March 6th through 8th of this year in Clearwater, Florida. So, Roger, I hope, are we going to get a chance to see you in Clearwater? Oh, yeah. I, w I would not miss that. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, always attend those at all possible. They're, they're great meetings. Well, I'm going to urge all of our subscribers, everybody that's listening, everybody that's watching, um, if you've never been to a brand chain event, um, you have been missing out for the past however many years <laughs> we've been doing these shows. They are the most incredible shows. It is a very awesome networking event. Uh, it's honestly where, um, I, I keep saying this, I feel like on every episode, but you know, we, we started our business in, in, in brand chain you know, back when it was PSDA, DMIA. And, and so we, you know, Without brand chain, you know, we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't have the success we have today. And, you know, really excited to see, you know, brand chain, you know, uh, working now with Printing United Alliance and really eager to see where that goes. But back to the show in May, you got to go to that show. Even if you're not a member, um, find a way to get there. Look us up. We can't wait to see you there. Um, let's see. Do we have any other news on, on our front? Or, Roger, do you have anything you want to share news-wise? You know, I, I just throw in a, a quick blip on that because, uh, you, you know, I've, I've attended that meeting forever. I think I've missed one since they've ever done them. Um, it, it all, kind of like the M&A thing, a lot of people are thinking, okay, it's the last leadership conference for Brand Chain. Oh, my gosh, everything's dying. It's not. You know, the Brand Chain's being merged in with Green United. This, this is a fantastic opportunity for both organizations. You know, granted, this is the last event that we will have under Brand Chain, but it's and this is going to be a great merging, a lot of good stuff coming out. It is a great meeting. Uh, I'll echo your comments about the networking. By far, that is the most fun and most important part of the session. You know, the fact that it's in clear water and we're going to have a glass of wine while we look out over the ocean. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Yeah, that's work. It's work, Roger. You can't call it anything but work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, um, I just love those 14-hour days on the beach. Heck yeah, heck yeah. 
Um, well, we're going to look forward to seeing our subscribers here. We're going to look forward to seeing Roger there. Um, it's going to be a great time. Oh, and hey, it is now time for our next segment, which is called Memorable Merch. Um, this is where we take an opportunity to let our guests kind of talk about something that's happened in the industry or something that they're familiar with that's been very impactful to them. And Roger, I understand you've got something kind of cool to talk about on today's show. I did, and I apologize for not having it. I'm, I've been traveling. I'm at li literally the merch I wanted to show is at another location, so I wasn't able to bring it with me. But w what I wanted to talk about, or I was going to show, was a jacket and a coffee maker. And that's going to sound like, okay, what's so last and hot about that? But, you know, one thing I've learned about merch, and, and I've been, like say, in manufacturing and, and on the side of working with vendors for, you know, 50 plus years. I've had a lot of stuff handed to me over the years. I've got more coffee cups and what they used to call trinkets and trash than you care to think. But I go back to what did somebody give me that I retained that always made me think of them? It doesn't necessarily mean it had to have their name on it, but I never forgot where that came from. And I got a jacket. This is going to sound odd. I got a jacket in 1983 from Appleton Papers because I helped them do a survey. Huh. That was it. Just a survey. It was it was detailed, but it was a survey. Took me 30 minutes maybe to do. I got the nicest jacket. Yeah, says Apple. I got the nicest jacket. I still have that jacket in my closet, and I still wear it in the winter. It, it's a great jacket, but I, I got it because I helped another company out that was in our space. They sent me a premium piece, not just a coffee cup. And that that's always meant really good to me. The other one that did the same thing was from Zycon. Now you go to the big digital company. Back in probably around 2010, I was invited up to their uh, headquarters up in Chicago to view a brand new piece of equipment that they were getting ready to launch. And I went up and I went through the day tour and they showed me the equipment. And when I got back a few days later, I got a curry coffee maker on, it was delivered in my front porch. And I called the guy up that does the marketing and I said, why are you doing this? You, you know me, I'm a consultant. I am never, ever going to buy his icon. <laughs> he goes, yeah, but if we appreciate your input. We listen to what you're going to say. We know you're going to talk to other people. We want you to have this. Now, you know, both of those items are relatively insignificant. They're, you know, maybe they cost a little bit, but it was the fact that I mean, it was given to me when it really wasn't going to generate a sale. And it just really struck to me that you know, if you want, want to create memorabilia and you want to create a memory, you know, m make it worthwhile. Don't, don't, don't do a coffee cup. No, no don't squeeze balls, balls, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just that's always hit me. I've always remembered those two things. So it's funny. So branded merchandise is incredibly powerful. Um, it can either be what Danny Ross and one of our friends over from Brandfield calls um, brand fill, like landfill. That's funny. Um, or, or it can be extremely impactful. So you, you just said, what was the year? 1983, Roger from Appleton. Is that right? 1983. Still so, have the jacket. So what is that? That's that, I mean, uh, 41 years ago. That piece of merch is still around 41 years later and is still creating memories, right? It's still there. It's etched in your brain. That's powerful marketing. Um, yeah, branded merchandise doesn't really get the, the credit it deserves, but the fact is you you have all this stuff that sits on your desk, on your shelf, on your wall, wherever it is. I mean, I've, I've got this kind of stuff right behind me. Um, good Lord, it, it, branded merchandise is king when it comes to, you know, to brand and, and, and that, that emotional feeling. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you know, what I think what make, makes the difference is some companies understand why you give out branded merchandise. They understand the value of it. And they understand that it's an investment for the future, and it needs to pull. It needs to pull people into you. It needs to connect you with a customer or a potential customer. Too many companies consider branded merchandise as a have to, and they hand them out like like candy. So they have no expectations of getting anything in return. Well, if you don't expect a return, you're not going to get a return. You know, pay attention to what you're doing. Give out less less items. Give out more in better items. You have far more gym back then, but just, most companies don't really think about it when they're doing their brand. That's that's why they need to work with brand experts. So Alyssa, take take some notes of it. No more coffee cups. No more squeeze balls. This is actually exactly yeah. why I've been trying to convince you guys to do liftoff pizza. 
lift up the I'm all over. I think I think that's where we need to go next. So forty one years from now, somebody's gonna have a lift off commerce pizza oven is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Roger up <Rappoons. laughs> I love it. Um I don't know where we're going with this show, but we always have fun. I told you we would. Um, so unfortunately we've got to keep moving. Um, it's time for our next segment. And before that, before we give Roger a parting gift, we're going to talk about tech trends. Uh, tech trends is the segment of the show where we talk about all the cool things that might be going on, either technology related or who knows, efficiency, innovation, all of those things kind of fall under that umbrella. And, uh, Roger, I understand you've got some, some trends that you're kind of seeing, uh, kind of nestled in with the M&A space. Is that right? Yeah, d- definitely. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of people ask us, you know, what's what's hot, you know, what what trends are out there right now. And, um, you know, there's there's a big space. You know, you, you've you got business forms, you've got commercial printing, you have digital printing, you have dye sublimation, you got promotional products out there, wide format signing. You got this massive gamut, you know, labels, flexible packaging. Well, that, that spectrum is, you know, here to here. I mean, it's massive. And, you know, the, the, what we have noticed is a, a definite trend toward the better tech or the newer technology, you know, the digital, the flexible packaging, um, digital imaging on flexible packaging, digital imaging direct to substrate, you know, not going through another middleman process of some sort. Um, those are really drawing a lot of interest. Uh, one of the ways we gauge that is by how many calls we get from private equity firms. And we get a call a week from a private equity firm saying, do you have a company that does this or is in this space? Um, because they're, you know, these guys are really looking hard at the printing and promo space right now. They're getting very anxious about it. So, you know, what we've seen is probably what a lot of people expect. Some of the, the printing segments are, you know, still retreating. They're declining in nature and everything. Um, but there's a lot of new stuff coming up. Um, it's still going to make the print and promo and graphic space a wonderful, wonderful space to be in for the coming years. Those those are really good points too, and I know one one we talk about technology and M and A, and I know this isn't a trend, uh, but it's something that um, you just made me think about. When 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 you're buying another company, it's very um, common for them to have their own like ERP order management system. Sometimes it's a homegrown system. Sometimes it's something they bought on the shelf. And I mean, we we didn't necessarily talk about that in the line, but I think it probably fits into culture somewhere. Um, what what do you see nowadays, you know, with folks buying other folks? Are they targeting companies that are leveraging the same systems or are you finding that it's just kind of across the board? What what, what insights do you have for us there? You, you know, when it comes to distributorships, I, I would say there is a trend toward trying to acquire someone that's on the same system. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, you know, I, I see that or they're at least acquiring someone that can be transposed over to their system very quickly and very easily. And that, and of course that means the system they're using has to be, you know, it has to be new. You know, you're, you're not going to find someone on a very old system doing a lot of migrations over to an old system. So some, you know, a distributorship that has a, a relatively new platform can assimilate the old platforms on fairly easily, or certainly the same platform on easily manufacturers. Um, not so much they they'll uh, they all want to stay on the same system over time but they also know that if i you know if a hundred million dollar manufacturer buys a 20 million dollar manufacturer that transition mate might take a year and they're okay with that slow process because what they want is the revenue they want the revenue they want to grow the business they want the product line they want the customer base that's more important than you know the erp system is is the necessary change that has to take place so what the other company has doesn't always necessarily come into play that much. You wouldn't be surprised how many companies we have come to us of size that don't have a good system. Um, it, it's amazing. You know, I, I feel like we could probably craft an entire show just around the topic of the acquisition and merger M&A part of technology, um, honestly. Um, there, there's so much that gets kind of folded up in there. Um, Oh, do you guys hear that? Oh, oh, you know what that means. It's time for cash or slash. All right, this is the uh, this is the segment of the show. I think this is my favorite segment of the show, where we get to um, award Roger a cool prize for being such a wonderful guest on our show. 
Roger, what 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 are you betting for? Do you want some swag? Do you want some cash? What are you hoping to get off that wheel? No, I want I want swag. I'm I, I'm I'm for the swag because there's, there is one thing that I I probably left out is you know it's it's not always what you get, but it's who you get it from. And as you well know, Andrew, I have tremendous tremendous respect for you and what you've done with your company in the industry. Um, I guarantee you. Whatever you send me will be utilized, and just out of my pure respect. Oh man, I think we need to give Roger everything on that wheel for that moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's how it's going to work: you just count down from three, and Alyssa will spin that wheel as hard as she can. All right, it, that that's not necessarily very hard, but. <laughs> All right, give us a countdown, Roger. Okay, three, two, one. Where's it going to land? It is. A $50 gift card. Well, guess what? We're going to bundle that $50 gift card with some swag. How about that? We will make sure you get what you came here for. <laughs> well, Roger, I want to thank you so much for being an, an incredibly wonderful guest on today's show. You've shared so many incredible insights about the world of M&A that, you know, even though I've done a few of these, uh, it just it really helps bring all these things to the forefront. And I really hope for some of our subscribers that are listening to your advice that they seek you out, contact Corporate Development Associates, um, if you're just thinking about selling or buying, Roger and the team over there at CDA are absolutely top notch. Guarantee it. All right. Well, thank you for everybody. Uh, thanks for watching our show and we'll see you next time. Yeah.